Okay, so hello everyone. So this is the last uh, lecture in the Paris Beijing Tokyo seminar. So the seminar will stop, but our collaboration will continue in different forms. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank all speakers during the past 10 years and my co-organizers from Tokyo, Takeshi Saito, Atsushi Shiho, Takeshi Tsuji, from Beijing, Yun Xuan Hu, Ye Tian, and Wei Zhu Jiang, and from Paris, Fabrice Rogozo. I would like also to thank uh, former organizers, Christophe Breuil, Ariane Mizar, and Yi Chao Tian. And it's my great pleasure to introduce the last speaker, Christophe Breuil, who will speak on modular representations of GL2L for unified L. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of you for this uh, nice invitation. So I'm going to talk on joint work with uh, Florian Ertzich, Yon Chan Hu, Stéphane Mora, and Benjamin Schrein. Okay, so the uh, contents uh, of the talk uh, will have three parts. In the first part, I will recall uh, past results. In the second part, I will state a new theorem. And the last part of the talk, which, which will actually be the, the longest part, will be some ideas on the proof, fairly precise ideas on the proof. Okay, so let me start with uh, uh, an explanation of the, of the setting and of past results. So throughout the talk, P will be a prime number, and F will be a, a finite field of characteristic P, which will be my coefficient field for all representations either on the GL2 side or on the Galois side. And I will assume it is big enough in the sense that it will contain all heck eigenvalues and so on, so that I don't have to worry about that. F will be a totally real number field where P is unramified, and I will fix V, uh, a place dividing P, a place of F dividing P, which will be my fixed place till the very end of the talk. I will only work at this place V. I will fix a quaternion algebra d over f, which is split at all places above p, and at exactly one infinite place. And finally, I will fix a, a continuous, absolutely irreducible Galois representation of Galois f bar uh, over f to gl to f, which is totally odd and which is modular. So the precise sense of modular will be clear in the next side, slide. And the general aim of this talk, and not only of this talk, but of lots of work, uh, <clears throat> is to understand better certain smooth admissible representation of GL to FV over F, which are associated to R bar, where FV is the completion of F at V. Okay. Okay, so I want precisely to, to, to define the representation of GL to FV I'm interested in, and it is called uh, maybe improperly, the local factor at V associated to R bar, which I, I recall the definition, at least uh, the idea of the definition, because it's a bit technical. So first, recall that for any compact open subgroup of the finite Adels of the, of the group D cross, I have a Shimura curve, XK over F, which is a smooth projective algebraic variety over F, okay? And the first representation one can consider is the following smooth representation of these finite adults over F. First, you take the inductive limit of the H1 et al of these uh, Shimura curves with coefficient in F. This inductive limit being taken over the compact open subgroup K. So uh, K is getting smaller and smaller in the inductive limit. And then I take the Robar isotypic, R bar, sorry, R bar isotypic part of this, uh, uh, of this Galois representation. Of course, there's a Galois action because it's a cohomology. And I assume it is non-zero. This is what I mean by being modular, okay? I'm not interested in modularity questions here, although at some point, at some point they are hidden somewhere, but I, I want to study, uh, well, something related to this representation, which of course I, I assume non-zero. Okay, so as I told you, I, I'm not instructed directly 
uh, 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 to this representation. I want to study representation of GL to FV. But the problem, you see, is that we do not know so far if this representation pi of R bar has a restricted tensor product decomposition, as a decomposition as a restricted tensor product of smooth uh, DW cross representations over all the, the finite places W. <coughs> it's called a, in the classical case, it's a node result due to FLAS. FLAS. It is conjectured here, I guess. It's an old conjecture now by, uh, I think, Buzzard, Diamond, and Jarvis, but it is not known. So you cannot define a local factor at V just by using this. You, you, you cannot use this. So you have to proceed in, in another way, which will be a sort of ad hoc way, and which will require some weak technical assumption on R bar. And let me just mention uh, that if one day one is able to prove that there is a flat decomposition like this, then it has already, or, already been checked that in that case, the local ad hoc factor that I'm going to define coincides in that, in that case with the uh, factor at V of such a decomposition if it exists. But it, one can define it directly. Okay, so I need to assume some uh, weak generosity assumptions on R bar from now on. So let me give them to you right away. I mean, this is not so much important for the talk. Oops. So P is bigger than five. R bar is absolutely irreducible, restricted to this uh, open subgroup of the Galois group. I need some weak generosity assumptions on R bar W, which are the uh, uh, restriction of R bar to the corresponding decomposition uh, Galois group, for places W different from uh, dividing P that I do not give here, not very important. I also need a condition at some places uh, where, uh, which are prime to P. Uh, if D ramifies at W, I want R bar W to be non-scalar. Okay. This is not very much important. So here's how one can define an, uh, the local factor we are interested in. I do not give all the technical details here. This is not uh, so much important, and this is not new anyway. So first, one can prove that under these conditions, one can define an, an optimal open compact subgroup KV uh, of the finite address of V outside of V. And then a certain smooth finite dimensional representation MV of KV outside of V over F, which has to be uh, thought of as a type or a reduction mode P of a type somehow. And then this local factor can be defined as follows. First, you take the uh, KV invariant homomorphism from this finite dimensional MV to pi of R bar. And this, and this is not enough. You need to uh, take some subspace for some, a few hacker operators at, at finitely many places different from V. So anything that is going on here is at places different from V. We do not touch V. And the purpose of this representation is to get rid of multiplicities that are coming from places different from V. Because you will see in the rest of the talk, that I'm going to use multiplicity one theorems. If I do not take this representation, I do not have multiplicity one. I have an artificial multiplicity different from one, which maybe can be dealt with later on. But for the moment, we don't want to be bothered with such problems. So we can define such a, we can get rid of these, these problems like this. So this uh, local factor was defined. Uh, so we, we don't know it is local. I mean, it still only, only depends. It's a GL2 FV representation, but it a priori fully depends on R bar. So it was defined in a paper uh, myself with Fred Diamond, I guess 10 years ago, and then was generalized in a paper by Emerton, G, and Savitz that uh, we mention uh, again in this paper, in this talk. Okay, so pi V of R bar is a smooth admissible representation of uh, uh, GL2 FV over F, and it has a central character, okay, which is this one. Okay, so I am going to recall some known results about this pi V of R bar. The first one, of course, is the case of GL2 QP. I mean, more precisely, the case where F equals Q and D is GL2. And in that case, pi V of R bar is fully known. So this is a, a work of Emerton building on work of Colmez, of myself, of uh, Kizin, of Laurent Berger, and of other people. It was uh, 10 years ago. Uh, so in particular, we know the following three things on pi V of R bar. We know that the gelfand kirillov dimension is one. I will recall just afterwards what the gelfand kirillov dimension is. 
We know that pi v of r bar is of finite length as a GL2 QP representation over f. And we also know that it is local in the sense that it only depends on the restriction of r bar to the decomposition group at v, r bar v. And I should mention before defining the gel function of dimension that this theorem, I guess, should in fact hold as soon as fv equals qp, because then we have dv is gl to qp. But as far as I am aware, <coughs> this is not known. This is known in some cases in the literature where uh, f is not q and d is not gl2, but fv is qp, but not in this generality. But it should, I think, it should be true. OK, but in this talk, we are not going to be interested in, in gl2 qp anyway. Let me recall now the gel funk of dimension. The, well, there are several definitions. I give to you the most, maybe the most direct one. So first, I recall to you the definition of the congruent subgroups, kv of n, just one plus p to the n uh, m2 o f v. So m2 is the two by two matrices, which is a, a, an open compact subgroup. And uh, a kv is a maximal compact open subgroup, gl2 o f v. OK, so I, we have all these uh, 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 congruent subgroups. And then here's the definition of the gel von Kirov dimension. So I guess it is uh, due to gel von Kirov, but uh, the, this precise definition uh, can be found in a recent paper by Emerson and Pascunas. Uh, so let pi v be any smooth admissible represent representation of kv of one over f. kv of one is the first congruence of group. Well, I could, it's an asymptotic definition, so I could even say kv of n for arbitrary n, but so there exists a unique integer, gk of pi v, which is between zero and the, the dimension of the uh, piedic analytic group kv as a z piedic uh, uh, analytic group. So in particular here, it is uh, four times the degree of fv, such that you, the, the following ratio here, the dimension of the invariant of kv by kv of n, which is a finite dimensional uh, vector space because it is admissible, divided out by the p to the n times this integer is bounded by two strictly positive real numbers. So they have to be uh, strictly positive because you could here take a, a bigger integer and then it would, it would tend to zero. Okay, so you don't want this, of course. So very roughly, you can think about the gel function of dimension as an integer that measures the dimension of these finite dimensional vector spaces when n is getting bigger and bigger asymptotically. Roughly, okay? Okay, so let me now recall some known results when uh, we are not with GL2QP. So of course, much less is known. Uh, so I need a few notation. Uh, well, F will be the uh, degree of my field FV, which uh, I recall is unramified. Q is the cardinality of the residue field. And I will denote by k and k of one, respectively, the maximal uh, compact subgroup at v and the first congruent subgroup. So I get rid of the index v. So I think these notations are quite, are quite uh, uh, standard. So you think you can rem remember them. This one maybe is less standard. k mod k of one is, will be denoted by gamma. This is just the finite group GL2 of fq, where fq is a residue field. And z of one will be the center of k of one. And finally, I need uh, to call MK, which is the maximal ideal of the Iwasawa algebra of K of one modulo the center Z of one over F. So maybe I should have called it MK of one, but well, uh, we don't use really the uh, Iwasawa algebra of K mod Z of one, only of K of one mod Z of one, so. Okay, so uh, I may, maybe I should uh, recall that Z of one act trivially on pi v of r bar. This comes from the condition of the central character. That's why in uh, the stock, everything will be modulo z of one. And then here is the uh, one state, one nice statement, which is known uh, in that situation for arbitrary fd and rho bar, I mean, as, as they are before. So one has the following theorem, which, uh, well, let me state it, and then I'll say, uh, I'll say something about the names. So we are concerned with the invariant of pi v of r bar under the first congruence subgroup, k of one. So this is of course a finite dimensional representation and this is an, and it has an action of k mod k of one, which is gamma. So this is a finite dimensional gamma representation. So it's a 
tiny, tiny piece of Pavi of Arbar. So it is also the kernel of Pavi of Arbar for the action of the maximal ideal of MK. Okay? And this finite dimensional gamma representation, even though you may think it is a small part of Pavi of Arbar, was not so easy to determine, and it is explicitly known. In particular, it is local. It only depends on R bar V. And most importantly for, uh, for me, it is multiplicity free, uh, meaning uh, as a representation of gamma. So all the uh, irreducible constituents are distinct. Uh, of, yes, and that will be the thing that I'm going to use uh, in the sequence. So this theorem, was um, first proven in the case of the EORI, of the proper EORI by Emerton, G, and Sabit, this paper that I already mentioned, that I will mention again in, in this talk. They made the uh, main breakthrough to prove this result, and they, uh, uh, they used patching functors. That was the main uh, tool they used. Uh, and then it was generalized by uh, uh, three kind of works. First, a paper in, uh, uh, well, I don't know, I think it's chronological, yes. A paper by Daniel Lee, Stefano Mora, and Benjamin Schrein. Then some work of Yon Chan Hu and Aoran Wang. And then another paper by Daniel Lee. And the, all this work builds on my paper with Pascunas of uh, many years ago, which itself builds on the seminal paper of, by Buzzard, Diamond, and Jarvis. Okay, so we have this multiplicity free result. I will come back to the theorem too later in the talk. So it is important for this talk. So I should now make clear that if dv is not gl to qp, apart from the theorem, which is not exactly what we had for gl to qp anyway, none of the statements in theorem one are known. So let me recall to you that these statements were the gel von Kirillov, the finite lengths, and the fact that the representation is local, okay? Okay, so now I want to state the, our main theorem, okay? Uh, so first, I need some hypothesis on R bar V. I need some precise generosity hypo hypothesis on R bar V uh, that is stronger than the weak generosity hypothesis I, I had as a running hypothesis in the beginning. So for this, I uh, need the Serre's fundamental character of level F and 2F, okay? So if I want to define them as I'm going to do, I need to fix embeddings because it's not very important. I mean, I guess you all know what are these fundamental characters. So first, I will assume that R B bar is semi-simple, and I will denote it by a row bar. So till the end of the talk, R B bar now is semi-simple. So in, I should mention that uh, in all these questions about um, cell weight and so on, and, uh, and these representations, this is always the first case that is usually considered. And then one, once we understand this case, usually we go to the non-semi-simple case right afterwards. But, but afterwards. So I assume it is semi-simple and I want some generosity hypothesis. So let me give it to you. Okay, so don't maybe, <coughs> this is a bit technical. You can of course write the restriction to inertia of Roba in terms of Serre's fundamental characters up to twist. So you have certain powers, of course that occurs. And I want the digits in the P expansion of these powers to be sort of very much in the middle. So between eight and P minus 11, that's the bounds we need. So in particular, this implies that P is bigger than 19 at the very end of this talk, okay? So I should mention that we have not tried to optimize this generosity assumption, but it could be that working harder, we could get 19 and then even working harder, we could get, uh, sorry, we could get 17 and then working harder, we could, we could get uh, 13 and so on. But um, well, for the moment, we find this. So P is large, bigger than 19. Okay, now I want to state the, our main result. It is the following. Under this assumption, we have the von kirillov dimension, which is F. Okay, so uh, on F, D, and R bar, this is the assumptions as uh, in the previous theorems, and on Rho bar, it is simple. Rho bar is R, V bar, it is semi-simple and sufficiently generic, as in the previous slide. So I should mention now three remarks on this theorem. Uh, first, that of course these assumptions on the row bar being semi-simple and sufficiently generic should be unnecessary. One should always have that the Kelvin-Kirov dimension is F. 
the second statement is that in the paper and by G and Newton, they prove that the gelfand kirov is always bigger than F. They prove this using the patching technique. So they, they, they know what is going on uh, at, inf at this infinite level, at infinity, and then uh, they mod out to uh, get down to pi v of arba. And when you do this, you don't exactly know what you lose or not when you mod out. So that's why they, they only have an upper bound, a lower bound, sorry, by f. So our main result is that f is also an upper bound. And finally, let me make clear right now that even under these assumptions on Robar, and even knowing the gelfand kirov dimension, so far, we do not know if pi v of arba is a finite length GL2 FV representation over F, and even less if it is local, meaning only depends on uh, the restriction of arba to the local decomposition group at V. But we have the gelfand kirov dimension. So the, the rest of the talk, which uh, is, you see, will be uh, longer than, uh, uh, if you look at the time, will be devoted to give you a fairly precise idea of the proof of this theorem. Yeah, some ideas on the proof. So we are going to use two intermediate theorems. The one which I call the first one, and a, a second one, which will come in, in two minutes. Uh, and I will explain the proofs of these two theorems. And when you put them together, you, you get the gelfand kirov dimension. So the first one is the following extension of theorem two. So theorem two, let me recall to you right away. It was this way. No, sorry. It's after this one. It was this, when you take the kernel of pi of abba for the maximal ideal for the Iwasawa algebra of the first congruent subgroup, you have something which is multiplicity free as a gamma representation and equivalently as a K representation. So what we do in the theorem the first intermediate theorem is that we take mk to the square. So of course, it's not anymore a gamma representation, but it's a k representation, which is finite dimensional. And we still prove it is multiplicity free. So you see, we need generosity assumptions for this, because in general, it is not. It's not going to be multiplicity free. But for the moment, we assume this multi we, we need these multi multiplicity free things. So that's uh, a main th the first uh, intermediate theorem. And the proof of it is uh, following the same techniques as, uh, as for the proof of theorem two, in particular by Emerton G and Savit and the followers. In particular, we need patching functors, but it's technically much harder, as uh, you will see. But uh, this is not this theorem that we're going to use directly. We're going to use a corollary, which is not very hard to, to derive from the theorem, but which concerns the Iwori subgroup not the uh, maximal compact uh, K. So let me recall first that the Iwori is the matrices in K that are upper triangular modulo P. So P here is, is my uniformizer because everything is unramified. FV is unramified. And I of one is a pro-P Iwori. So it is the, the, the group of matrices that are upper unipotent mod P. And I will denote, as I did for uh, K, uh, M of, uh, I, which will be the maximal ideal of the Iwasawa algebra of the proper Iwori modulo uh, Z of one. Okay, and the corollary we are going to use is that if you consider now pi V of Arba and then you take the kernel by this maximal ideal to the cube, so it is an, a representation of the Iwori and it is multiplicity free. So if you take an irreducible representation, smooth irreducible representation of the Iwori, in characteristic P, then the proper Iwori acts trivially on it because it is irreducible. Hence, it is a representation of I mod I of one. But I mod I of one, I of one is a finite torus, which is uh, an abelian group and, and of cardinality prime to P, okay? So the irreducible representation of the Iwori uh, over F are just characters. So this, this statement means that all the characters that occur as sub quotients of this representation are all distinct. So you see that you, of course, need generosity assumption for that. Uh, and we are going to use this corollary. Uh, okay, now the second intermediate theorem is the following, which is entirely on the Iwori side. So the, the first, I mean, apart from this corollary, the first intermediate theorem will be entirely on the uh, somehow K and K of one side. And the second intermediate theorem is entirely on the Iwori side. It is the following. Take pi v 
which is any smooth and miscible representation of the E over E mod Z of one over F, such that the kernel of pi V by the, this ideal M I to the cube is multiplicity free, as we had, as we know in the case of pi V of R bar, but here this is any pi V. Then, in that case, the Gelfand Kirillov dimension of pi V is smaller than F. Okay, so re re recall that the Gelfand Kirillov dimension is something asymptotic for the compact open subgroup, so I can perfectly, uh, it is perfectly defined for a representation of the UOV. Okay, and in, it then directly follows from this previous corollary in this theorem that the Gelfand Kirillov dimension of pi V of ABA is smaller than F. Okay, and by G Newton for, for the reverse inequality, we get the main result. Okay, so now I will explain the proofs of these two intermediate theorems. And I will start with the second one, not the first one, because the second one is, is in fact shorter, although it was uh, for us the hardest one. So I need uh, some further notation. So first, uh, let me know the, by, by pi v with the strange symbol, the algebraic dual of, of pi v, okay? And then of course, if, so it is a, a, a module of the Iwasa algebra of the Propi worry. So when I mod out by the maximal ideal of this uh, Iwasa algebra, I get the dual of the invariant on the I over, which is a finite dimensional representation, a finite dimensional um, representation of I mod I of one. So it is just a bunch of characters. It's a direct sum because I of I of one is prime to Q. So we have certain characters, sky alpha, finitely many, which are what they are which are all distinct by assumption. Let me denote now by projective Proch chi alpha, the projective envelope of this character chi alpha in the category of compact. So here it is truly the Iwaori, uh, the Iwaza algebra for the Iwaori uh, group, not the propriori, but it, in fact, it is just the tensor. You take the Iwaza algebra of I of one, mod of one, and you tensor by chi alpha. And then the Iwaori acts on this. And this is the projective envelope of chi alpha. So we know that chi alpha does not appear in mi pi v dual mod mi cube because we use our assumption that pi v dual mod mi cube pi v dual is multiplicity free with a finite dimensional representation of i, which is multiplicity free. And since chi alpha already appears in uh, uh, the quotient by mi, it doesn't appear in the kernel. And then using this, it is not difficult, it is formal using uh, these, uh, these, these definitions together with the uni universal property of uh, projective envelopes to prove the following. So uh, if, you, if you, I mean, there will be some uh, three things coming. They might look a bit uh, uh, technical, but they are not hard to prove. So first, there, uh, yes, yeah, so one can prove there exists uh, for each alpha, uh, I equivalent maps, H alpha, from uh, two F copies of proje the projective envelope of chi alpha to itself, to just one copy, such that we have the following property. First, the image of H alpha is in, uh, inside Mi to the square uh, prof chi alpha. The induced map proj A proj I chi alpha mod Mi to F copies to Mi square mod Mi cube is injective. And finally, and most importantly for us, pi v dual will be a quotient of the uh, direct sum of the co-kernel, direct sum of alpha of the co-kernels of all these alpha. So in all of this, we only use this multiplicity free things and, and universal properties of projective envelopes. I mean, and, 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 and easy stuff on E was our algebra. So you see that theorem five, the one bounding the gelfand kirov dimension, it, I mean, first we obviously have that the gelfand kirov of pi v will be smaller than the maximum of alpha, uh, because of the last uh, statement here, of the gelfand kirov of this co-kernel, except you have to dualize back. Okay, so here there's a sort of hidden duality between discrete and compact modules. So you, here you are on the compact side, you, duali you dualize back to get uh, back on the side of smooth, admissible representation of the worry. And uh, you can compute the gelfand kirov dimension of this co-kernel, um, uh, assuming we have these uh, one and two here. And you take the maximum of alpha, and this is bigger than GK because of three, GK of pi, pi V. But in fact, it is not very difficult to prove that the Gelfand kirov dimension of such a co kernel is smaller than F. And this uh, ultimately boils down to a calculation in the Gradid ring for the 
powers of the maximal ideal of the Siwaza algebra. And it turns out this crowded, the crowded ring was actually computed in a nice paper by Laurent Clausel. Of course, it can also be derived from results of Lazar and so on. I mean, this is not so hard, but it was nice to have uh, this paper of Laurent Clausel at hand. And uh, uh, using a not so hard calculation, we get the, the, the Gelfand of Bach. Okay, so uh, I should mention before I switch, so that, that's the end of the second intermediate theorem. So you know it's not so hard, except that it took us a long, long, long time to find this slide. Okay, the rest somehow is, uh, and the reason is that uh, the rest, there's already an existing strategy, but not for this one. But for the first one, there is an existing strategy, which is the one of Emerton G. Savit, which we are going to, and, and, and the followers, which we are going to push one step further. Okay, so now we leave the world of Iwori and we enter the world of the uh, maximal compact. So this is the world of cell weights and all these things. So let me recall that uh, cell weights is an irreducible representation of gamma over f, finite dimensional, of course. And I will denote, as I did for characters, proj k sigma, the projective envelope of sigma in the category of compact uh, modules of a ziwa as a algebra of k. I need k here. Uh, so this is an infinite dimensional representation, which uh, if you take the, if you dualize back in the world of smooth uh, uh, representation of K is admissible. And the reason we introduce this protective uh, envelope is that it is enough to prove this by just using the universal property of approach K sigma. Let me recall that the first intermediate theorem, I recall it, is here. This is this one, the kernel of Pi of Arba, uh, for, for the, uh, mk to the square is multiplicity free. So uh, uh, the, 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 the irreducible constituents are cell weights and we want them to be all distinct. So in particular, we certainly want, uh, well, we want this to be, to be true, okay? And in fact, it's even enough to prove this statement for some specific cell weights, which are called cell weights of Robar, which are those cell weights which we know already embeds into pi v of arba. So, so such that the, the, the home k sigma to pi v of arba is non-zero. So of course in that case, we already know that the dimension here is bigger than one, bigger or equal than one. So we need to prove that it is exactly one. Uh, so now sigma, from now on sigma will be a cell weight of rho bar. And the main tool for that will be the patching functor m infinity of Emerton G. Sabit, which itself builds on the patching technique of Taylor Wiles and of Kizin. So I'm not going to recall exactly what it is because I wouldn't, I mean, this would uh, be a bit too, 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 too technical and, 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 and would require too much time. But let me just say this, this is an exact covariant functor from a continuous representation of K of a finite type WF module. So WF is the fit vectors. Uh, well, there's an assumption with a central character that you can forget here. To finite type R infinity modules, which of course satisfies several properties uh, in terms of support uh, when you apply it to some types and so on, which I, uh, uh, if you want to know them, you can check the paper of Emerton G. Savit. So here R infinity is a usual patch deformation ring, which in our situation, because of our generosity assumption, will be a full power series ring over the V vectors. Okay, so of course the, the, this functor is uh, yeah depends on uh, many many choices. It depends on the global setting, but also on many choices. But so it's highly highly non-canonical. But we just use it and and uh, of its uh, many properties that I will recall when I use them in the sequel of the talk. And they are extremely useful, of course. Okay, so. Um, I will now restate the thing we have to prove in terms of the patching functor. So somehow we are going to lift everything to infinity because it seems impossible to prove this directly. So let me denote by I mean M infinity, Gothic M infinity, the maximal idea of this local ring, this power series ring. And let me take V, which is any finite dimensional representation of K, so the, the GL2 or V over F. Then from one, one thing we get from the, concept, from the properties of M infinity is the following equality. You can compute the K invariant homomorphism 
from V to pi V of R bar, that's local factor at V. In terms of uh, uh, the dual of M infinity of V, applied to this V here, mod the maximal ideal of uh, R infinity. So recall that M infinity of V is a finite type R infinity module. So when you mod out by uh, the maximal ideal, it is a finite dimensional F vector space. And I just take the dual. Okay, here also this is finite dimensional because the, the representation is admissible. So <clears throat> we want to prove the, the theorem for the multiplicity, the, the, the theorem for the multiplicity free part, which is uh, the most important, follows from the fact that this uh, dimension is one, which equivalently is the, uh, the fact that the R infinity module, M infinity of um, uh, this, uh, Proche k sigma but mk square is cyclic. Cyclic meaning that you only need one generator, or in other terms, that is a quotient isomorphic to a quotient of R infinity. So if you know this, of course, then when you mod out here, you get one dimensional vector space. So the dual is also one dimensional, and you are done. I mean, you are done for v equals Proche k sigma but mk square. So this is now what uh, I am going to do in the rest of the talk is to give you an idea how one can prove the cyclicity. So, uh, so far, I mean, this reduction to the cyclicity is not due to us. This is something that is due to uh, Emerton G. Savit and, 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 and the, the followers. So there's no new idea. Now, now this is, now we, we, we really start to be um, uh, analyzing this representation. So uh, first, there's, uh, something you can uh, consider is such the kernel the, the, you can mod out by mk instead of mk square. But if you mod out by mk, then you are back in the world of gamma representations. And so it is actually the projective envelope of the cell weight sigma in the category of gamma representation over f. Okay. Uh, but here we do not mod out by mk, we mod out by mk square. So it is not anymore a representation of gamma. So we have to understand this guy. And we can, uh, I mean, this is not so hard. Let me recall uh, what it looks like. First, I need, there's an algebraic part. So let me denote by V2 tau, the following algebraic representation of gamma. I recall that gamma is GL2 FQ as a residue field. So GL2 FQ, FQ acts on sim2 F to the square. If you fix an embedding FQ into F, which I do, I take an arbitrary embedding, then I, I, I twist by uh, minus one, uh, dead to the minus one. And everything uh, 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 is for the, I mean, is using the embedding FQ in, inside F, which is tau, so I, I put tau here. And I have as many such algebraic representation as I have such embeddings, which, uh, which is F. I have F such embeddings, F, little f. Okay, then you can prove that Proj k sigma but mk square as a k representation is an extension of two gamma representation. You have Proj gamma sigma as a quotient, and as a, as a sub representation, you have a direct sum over all embeddings tau of this Proj gamma sigma tensor by V2 tau. Okay, and this is a non-split extension for all the um, all the push forward, all the uh, uh, direct summons here that you can consider. Let me just also mention that. We know what the tensor product is. I mean, when you tensor something which is projective, you always get something which is projective. So we know that this thing is a direct sum of projective uh, envelopes of some cell weights, and we know which, which are the cell weights. So you need three cell weights. Well, you recover Proj gamma sigma, but you have two other cell weights, which are a, so, a small modification of sigma in the direction of the emitting tau, which I do not uh, recall explicitly, but which are, uh, uh, everything can be made completely explicit. Okay, so this is the, rep the K representation, Proj K sigma, modulo MK square. And uh, for the rest of the talk, I will need to introduce uh, the following quotient of Proj K sigma with MK square, uh, which I will call Q tau for each embedding tau. So this is the unique quotient of Proj K sigma with MK square, which is non split extension here. So, so, so this is a push forward. I cancel anything that is not at the embedding, fixed embedding toe. And for the fixed embedding toe, I have this tensor product, which is direct sum of two, and I, I, I cancel this Proj gamma sigma in the middle. So I get a non-split extension like this. 
Okay, and I will use Qto in the next slide. Uh, okay. Okay, so to, to, to proceed to prove this, so I recall that we want to prove this theorem. M infinity approach chi sigma mk square is, is cyclic, so we are going to apply M infinity to all these projective things. But uh, we also need to lift the k representation approach chi sigma of mk square as a lattice, as a free WF module with a continuous section of k. Uh, because then we will be able to relate it to Galois representations and Fontaine theory. So that's why we lift it. But uh, it's, yes. Sorry, uh, Java has a question. Yes. So, you sorry? mentioned tensor products, but do you can you tensor product those things only when one factor is finite dimensional, or you have also some completed tensor products when? No, everything is finite dimensional here. The, I mean, uh, I'm Ah, but, ah, because of this, okay, because you are working with uh, modulo mk squared, oh, yeah. then you need mod, mod mk squared in the, in the yeah, others. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, indeed, this is finite, this is infinite dimensional, but mod mk squared, because this is an, the dual of an admissible representation. Uh, uh, okay. Okay, this is finite dimensional. And, and this tensor product is, uh, ah, okay, this is also finite dimensional? Yeah, everything is finite dimensional. Okay, okay, okay. Basically, till the end of the talk, uh, except the very last, the two last two slides, everything will be either finite dimensional over F or a finite rank over the bit vectors. Okay. Free of finite rank over the bit vectors. So this is what I need to know here. Uh, I'm going to do here. I'm going to lift the scale representation as a free WF module with a continuous action of K, which reduces mod P to approach K sigma, but MK squared. So it is, easy to lift proj gamma sigma, because actually there's a unique representation of gamma lifting proj gamma sigma as a free module of a WF. So uh, this is, a, you know, this is an old result due to Brouwer, I guess, which you can find in Serre's book. Uh, so what's the representation linear des groupes finis, for instance. Um, okay, it's also easy to lift, sorry, oops. Ah, no, no, I don't want. Okay, it's also easy to lift the algebraic part. Uh, as, uh, uh, as a, so here, this is a representation of gamma. Here, this is a representation of K, not of gamma. It is not even smooth, it is algebraic. Uh, so I lift uh, V2 tau as V2 tau tilde, which is sim two of v, two copies of the V vectors, and there's a twist by the determinant. And to make K, to make K act on this, I need to fix also an embedding, say, okay? K is GL2 of OFV, and uh, uh, OFV uh, embeds into, uh, which is a ramified embed into WF via the embedding uh, uh, tau of FQ into F. Uh, okay, so this is, and uh, here's the first thing one can prove. So I need a comment. If you take this tangent product here just as it is, forget about the one over P, one second. And if you reduce it mod P, then you get the tangent product uh, this one, V2 tensor approach gamma sigma, which is uh, a direct sum of, uh, of this projective here, okay? We are not, uh, we do not want this, we want to find Qto. So Qto is, is uh, you, you take the same projective envelopes, the same silhouette, except that you put an extension in that, in that order, okay? So it turns out that there is a lattice when you invert P in this finite dimensional uh, vector space, uh, there is a lattice which is not the tensor product of these obvious lattices, which is not a lattice, but which exists, such that uh, when you reduce it mod P, you exactly find this non-split extension in the right order. Okay, so this is the first result we proved. Uh, here, and the second result is that now we, we from this we can get the, a lattice lifting proj k sigma but mk square. We take the following kernel. So we use this lifting here this sort of power lifting, we map it, uh, we reduce it mod P to proj gamma sigma, and we embed it diagon diagonally into F copies of proj gamma sigma. That's for the definition of this map on this direct summand. Now the de definition of this map on this direct summand is just that L2 tau reduces mod P to L2 tau mod P, which subject onto proj gamma sigma, okay? Because here, the subjection is here. 
And so for each embedding, you map it to one copy of Project Gamma Sigma. You have F embedding, so you have F copies. And you take the direct sum of these morphisms, and you take the kernel of this. Then, so here, this is free over WF. Here, this is in characteristic zero. Okay, so this is uh, somehow a lattice inside this, uh, this thing when you invert P. Uh, and this lattice mod P is exactly the projective envelope of sigma but MK squared. So we are going to apply the patching functor to all these, these guys. And, and indeed, we want to prove that M infinity of L is cyclic. If we do this, we are done. So we know that already by previous work of uh, uh, Daniel Lee, uh, Stefan Mora, Benjamin Shan, and uh, Yon Chanu, Aaron Wang, that M infinity of this uh, proj gamma sigma is cyclic, proj gamma sigma tilde, the lift of uh, proj gamma sigma. Uh, remember, I mean, we are in the, um, th there are other work on this, but here I re remember that we are in the semi-simple case for uh, our, our V-bar. I mean, sigma is a cell weight of a semi-simple um, representation of Galois F V-bar mod MV. And uh, the first thing one can prove is the following proposition is that the, the R infinity module M infinity of L2 to mod P, and hence by an application of Nakayama, the, the, M infinity of L2 to both are cyclic, uh, meaning uh, our quotient, here it is a quotient of R infinity mod P, and here it is a quotient of R infinity. Uh, and well, so I don't know how, how time I have left. Uh, yeah, I have uh, 14 minutes. Thank you. So um, let me say that the techniques to prove this are, are standard with respect to what is already in the papers by uh, Emerton Gisavit, Daniel Lee, uh, uh, Stefano Mora, Benjamin Schreyon, Chanou, and, and so on. So maybe I'm not going to insist on, on, on this. The techniques are not, uh, are not new. Maybe uh, I will. Uh, this is a standard devisage. Uh, and uh, okay, let me skip this. Uh, so uh, to, to proceed to the next step. So the, the next step is the following. So remember we want, to, we want to, we are interested in L, which is the kernel of this direct sum to F copies of Proj Gamma Sigma. But before going to L, we are going to proceed step by step, adding one embedding after the other, the other. And in particular, we start with L tau, which is the kernel, the same kind of kernel, except we only take one embedding L two tau. So there's uh, accordingly one copy of Proj Gamma Sigma here. And we take the kernel of this. So this is just a fiber, pro a fiber product. Here you've got three WF representation of K here and here, which uh, we know have the mod P have a, the common Proj Gamma Sigma quotient. So we take the fiber product. And now I, I will explain why M infinity of L tau is cyclic. So by exactness of M infinity, M infinity of L tau is also a fiber product. But M infinity of Proj gamma sigma, which we know is cyclic, M infinity of L tau two, uh, which we know is cyclic, over M infinity of Proj gamma sigma, which we also know is cyclic because this one is cyclic. However, it could be that the fiber product is not cyclic, of course. So we have to prove it is cyclic. And the proof for L, for, for, for where you, you add all the embeddings, direct sum of all, all embeddings here, can be reduced to this case by just an induction. So uh, once we know this one is cyclic, we're going to add another embedding. We are going to have another fiber product and so on, okay? So now uh, I will explain why this uh, fiber product is cyclic. And here we enter the world of Galois representation. So uh, let me denote by RV, which is uh, R square rho bar. Rho bar is R bar V. This is our local Galois representation, semi-simple. Uh, this is the, 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 the local uh, Noetherian ring parameterizing frame deformations of rho bar in the sense of uh, Kizin, Maser. So, so there are no conditions, except there's a condition on the determinant that I will, uh, I will forget here, that's important. So here's what follows from previous cyclicities that are just mentioned. So first, uh, we have R infinity, which I told you was a full power series ring of a W of F. But in fact, before being a full power series ring of a W of F, it is a full power series ring of a RV, this here, which in the particular case here, because of our generated assumption, turns out to be also a full power series ring. But let me forget it here. 
Okay, so we know that m infinity of approach gamma sigma is a quotient of r infinity, and in fact, because of these variable, these patching variables play no role at v, we know it is a quotient only on r v. So there's an ideal j such that it is isomorphic to this. Likewise, for the other one, because we know these two things are cyclic r infinity modules, and of course, same thing for for the reduction mod p here by exactness of m infinity, it is just r v mod p j. Okay. Um, but in fact, we know what are j because now we can we are in specific situation. We know sigma is a, a is a cell weight of a semi simple row bar, and we can compute things. Everything is quite explicit, and in fact, we can prove that R v mod j exactly parameterizes potentially crystalline lift of row bar of any time type. Type here is Bushnell Kutsko type, whose reduction mod p contains the cell uh, the cell weight sigma and with parallel hot shape weight one zero. So it's not, I should mention that it's not the kind of usual deformation rings that uh, uh, one usually considers uh, because we, it is a multi-type deformation ring. I mean, we take all, we, we take several types and not just one. Usually you fix one type, you fix hot shape weights and you consider potentially crystalline lifts of robot with this type and this hot shape weight. Here we consider all types, all tame types, meaning, uh, by the way, tame means they are representation of zero to FQ in characteristic zero. So uh, uh, level, level zero, if you, if you like, I mean, uh, whose reduction mod p contains sigma. Take all these types. And we know actually this is exactly uh, uh, the quotient we have. So this is the place where I think modularity statements are some, somehow hidden, because modularity statements are hidden in the supports of these I mean, infinity modules. And the reason we know this is uh, we derive it from the fact that if we just fix one of these same types, and uh, for these hot shit weights, then it, uh, so, so the usual deformation ring for one of these uh, types, we actually know it is a domain. We prove it is a domain. So since we know the support is a union of irreducible components uh, for a fixed M type, it must be everything. And now when we put them all together, it's, it, we can derive that we have, must have the full chain. Likewise, for this guy, except we have cell weights, uh, hot state weights, two minus one at the embedding time which of course are coming from the algebraic part uh, that uh, the previous talk. So we again compute everything explicitly. So it's a little bit more complicated because now we have to deal with hot state weights two minus one that is up to twist hot state weight three comma zero. Uh, so the computations are more difficult, but, but it, can be, it can be done. It can be done even by hand. Uh, and likewise, the, the single type deformation rings with these hot state weights are also domain. So we, we can prove this. And oops, and uh, uh, yes. And so now, if you forget about these extra variables, the thing you need to prove is that this fiber product here, which so you only now consider these guys, forget about these patching variables, you need to prove it is a quotient of RV. If you know this, it will be cyclic, so meaning one generator over RV, and you will be done. And to prove this, it's easy to see that you need to prove that J plus J tau is exactly p comma j. And for this, it is enough to prove that p belongs to j plus j2. So, so what we know here is that a priori j plus j2 contains a power of p. But we have to prove that it contains p, really, and not, and not only p, p cube and so on. So in other terms, we, this is something like we have to prove that the, uh, <clears throat> the potentially crystalline representation here with hot shade weights 0 and everywhere and the potentially crystalline liftings here with H8 weights uh, outside tau and two minus one at tau are as little congruent as possible. And this can be done by hand and explicitly we, because we can, uh, of course, if we want to prove this, we can check it mod p square. If you prove this mod p square, you are done. And this, this is something you can do uh, by hand. Okay, and this finishes the proof of the main result we have cyclicity for m infinity of m. Uh, so I want to derive one application of this uh, gelfand kirillov business, uh, which, which uh, well, was sort of nice for me. Uh, it is an application to the piedic langlands program. So it is based on the following theorem, which is uh, a theorem uh, of Dotto and Daniele which itself builds on work of uh, uh, Karayani, Emerton, G, Zerity, Pascunas, and Shin. And it has to do with big patch modules. So 
so far I was considering, I was patching uh, things like HUM K, HUM K invariant homomorphism from some finite dimensional V to pi V of R, and maybe the dual of that, okay, which uh, was finite dimensional. And I was patching this with this M infinity, everything was a finite rank over infinity and so on. But it turns out you can also patch the full dual of pi V of R bar, which is of course infinite dimensional now, okay? Um, and of course, it, this is not anymore, this is something which is uh, finitely generated over R infinity, double bracket GL2 of OFV, which, which is K, uh, but this is not anymore finitely generated over R infinity. And it has a compatible action of GL2 FV, okay? So that, that's, one can do this. And this is done in the paper, a recent paper by Doto and Lee. Uh, Building on, on, on previous work, but here they exactly do the thing we need for, the, for this local factor and so on. And so the corollary of our main result is the following, which was known. I mean, we, we, it's not new that if we had the gel from Kirchhoff dimension, then th this would follow, but uh, it's nice to recall it. So take any map from R infinity to OE, any specialization somehow of WF algebras where E is a finite ex extension of QP, so co co containing WF. Um, then the, the corresponding specialization on M infinity, M infinity tensor R infinity OE, except you have to dualize back. back. So here this is, I think, a Shikov dual, something like that. I mean, you have to be careful about duality. And you invert P. Well, this is non-zero. And I mean, then if it's non-zero, it is admissible unitary continuous representation of GL2 FV over E, lifting by V of R bar. I mean, it is a banner space. Uh, which has a unit ball which is preserved by the GL2 action and which uh, lifts by V of R bar. But the thing is, it is non zero. And to prove the idea of the proof is that you need flatness. You need to prove that M infinity is flat over R infinity, and then you don't, if you know this, then you know that specialization are non zero. But, but this follows from the uh, Gelfon Kalov, our main result, together with a, a result. Uh, be, that M infinity is a Quen Macaulay over this non commutative ring. So here, Quen Macaulay is in the sense of our slender books bomb and so on. There's only one xi which is non zero, which is a result of G Newton. And this implication is a so called miracle flatness. So in non commutative setting. So we have uh, this result. So I think now it is uh, yeah, almost, almost time. So it's good. I, have, I just have one slide. So I should mention that so far, Robar was semi simple. But we think the case Robar non semi simple will work as well. And this is actually ongoing work of Yun Chan Hu and Ao Han Wang. So, of course, we need some generosity assumptions, but Robar will be non semi simple. And finally, one other thing we hope to uh, get. So, <coughs> maybe uh, before I. Uh, so, so we, we prove that the Gelfunkel of dimension of this sort of minimal representation of GL to FV, where we forget about. Where we, we have forgotten as much as we could uh, about multiplicities coming from other places different from B. So we, we prove that the Gelfand Kirov dimension is F. But of course, if you add multiplicities coming outside of V, uh, 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 finitely many, for instance, if you don't take the right, exactly the right compact open subgroup and so on, you will get something like several copies of pi V of R bar, but this, will, this won't change the Gelfand Kirov dimension. So we shouldn't need these multiplicity one assumptions and so on to prove, in fact, in the end, the Gelf, that the Gelfand Kirov dimension is F. And <clears throat> maybe we can prove it. In fact, <clears throat> we hope to prove that at least for suitable level K of V outside of V, compact open subgroup of the finite adults of D cross outside of V. So we, I, I do the same thing as I did at the very beginning uh, to define pi of R bar, but I only take the inductive limits over open compact subgroup of GL2 FV with a fixed prime to V uh, level. Uh, and then I take the R bar isotypic part. So this is a priori bigger than pi V of R bar. Many, many copies of pi V of R, of R bar, a priori. But we hope to prove that di the Gelfand Kirov dimension is still F. So of course, then we, we have to deal with things which are not anymore of multiplicity one. Okay. So I guess, uh, I guess this, I guess yeah, I'm done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Christophe, for this very nice lecture. So we have time to take a few questions. Are there any question or comment? So uh, when you take the home from R bar to something, yes. uh, from homology, 
uh, what do you know about this cohomology? Like, uh, can you tell sub quotients which are R bar but not sub? Okay, I mean, I, do you... I, yeah, I don't know. We only take R bar as a sub. You are, you are right, but I, I don't know about uh, other kind of things you can do. Of course, this is infinite dimensional, <clears throat> whether an R bar is two dimensional. So indeed, it could be that uh, there are things of, uh, which are not as a sub, but then, uh, then I don't know. Usually, I mean, in that setting, one usually uh, considers such things, and, uh, and we're very happy to be able to prove something about this. Are there other mm -hmm. questions? Yeah. Uh, Daniel Le has a question. So he yes. has ah, a lot of time. Uh, OK, yeah, he wrote it. OK. So how about higher powers of MK? So uh, we think we can, OK, so let me go back to the, from this, if you assume generosity enough, let me see, where is the, blah, blah, blah. yeah. I think, but we didn't, we didn't write it. I think that from by view of our MK, by some induction uh, business, we can probably get higher powers. If you, we can go, go, probably go a little bit further by some kind of induction, if you assume sufficient generosity, MK cube, NK4, and so on. But uh, so far, uh, it was not clear to us that we would gain so much from uh, proving these things. So, I mean, MK square for what we have in mind seems to be enough. So maybe in the future, it would be interesting to have uh, higher powers. But of course, in general, you cannot expect, of course, to be multiplicity free, even uh, if you very generate, because this, I mean, you have finitely many set weights and this is an infinite dimensional representation, so. Okay, so I don't see other questions. Do you see something? Ah. Like so, so in the definition of uh, this Gelfand K of the dimension, so you have, uh, you take ratio and it's bounded by ah, okay. okay, let me. So, yeah, in the very beginning. So now you know this uh, existence. So, so you can you can take consider the limit. So, uh, you, can you? Do you know if it's converges or the meaning of the value? So, so sorry, I, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Ah, so you you can you can take the limit to, with respect to n. Oh, yeah. And uh, can you say something about no, the I, limit? No, I don't know more. In fact, in fact <clears throat> this uh, this is not exactly the the definition we use. We use the definition in terms of uh, Auslander Buxbaum theory, things like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we, I don't know, also you are asking whether this thing is maybe just has a limit instead of just being bounded, right? This yeah. Is yeah, yeah, so I'm, I'm no, wondering I don't if we, yeah. we don't know anything about that. Uh-huh, I see, thank you. Okay, okay so if there are no uh, other questions. So another another yes, thing offer. of the theory of dimension, I am not so, so you have some compact module, but of course you can dualize. And yes. is, does it get and Kirill of dimension comes from the fact that somehow after you dualize, you get finitely generated module over something? I don't know. This is smooth admissible. Okay, so yes. this. No, no. When you dualize, you get something finitely generated over, yes. over the, the, the Iwasawa thing, yes? Yes. Yes. And so you can look at the dimension exactly. in the sense of non-commutative exactly. analog of dimension in unitarian rings. Yes. And this is and the same. This is the of dimension. Yes. So in analogy with the theory of the Hilbert function and so on in the commutative case, you expect that, and in fact, in this case, Lazar and so on, it means there is some theory for those kind of non-commutative rings. So, so the question before was whether there is some kind of a Hilbert uh, a polynomial or something similar in this non-commutative setup for non-commutative, uh, yeah. certain non-commutative rings which are close to be commutative in the sense that you, you have enough, you have some filtration, I mean, so like I this think, kind of people sour. So I think, yeah, well, I think, so I, I forgot a little bit, but I think this, uh, yeah, you know, <clears throat> if you know that the dimension, if you know the dimension, kill of dimension, indeed, you know that this must be something like a polynomial of degree, in N of degree, uh, so this dimension of degree, uh, the Gelfand curve dimension plus one maybe, or uh, let me see, if the Gelfand, if the Gelfand curve dimension is zero, which means that this thing is bounded for any N, which means that then pi V is finite dimensional, 
So this is a constant polynomial. Yes, this must be this. So I think you can prove that uh, this is one of the uh, uh, aspect of Geffen curve dimension. If I'm not mistaken, maybe Yun Chan Hu can, can correct me, that this dimension is actually a polynomial for n big enough, is actually a polynomial in n of degree Gelfand curve dimension plus one. No, no, but it cannot be because you put p to the n in the denominator. Ah, no, no, no. I mean the upper. I mean the numerator. No, no, no. But if you write in the denominator, ah, p, 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 okay, okay, okay. So it's uh, uh, okay. The variable is not n. It's maybe p to the n. Yeah, Daniel Lee confirmed polynomial in p to the n. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, you're right. Yeah, not n. P to the n. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Ah, thank you for the clarification. Well, okay. Welcome. So then uh, we thank uh, Christophe for this nice lecture and uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, have a safe and a nice summer vacation. Goodbye. Good. Same to you.